Sometime last year, I realized I despised the word can't. It was a Monday around 1 p.m., and I sat in my office in my dressing gown, trying my best not to procrastinate, as you do. I also don't like getting dressed before midday, but that's another story. Before I knew it, YouTube had sucked an hour of my life away with cat videos. <laughs> We've all been there, right? Sometimes on a daily basis. But during this time, I came across a, a video interview between a reporter and an MP, and I was simply shocked at how many times the word can't popped up and its associated phrases like, it can't be done and you can't do that. Now, it's probably, I'm out of breath now, <laughs> that bloody balloon. Now, <clears throat> it's probably the stubborn only child syndrome within me, but whenever I hear that word, my instant reaction is always, why not? It's so negative, and it insidiously instills self-limiting beliefs into whoever says it. And over time, that accumulating negativity compounds to a point where it forms an everlasting grip on one's psyche, which is one of the many reasons why so many people are controlled by fear and fear of failure throughout their lives. So I've got a vision. I have a vision where our kids live in a world free from crushing debt levels, wars, disease, and famine, but also from a childhood of self-limiting beliefs. Now, this utopian world is far from our current position, but what needs to happen to achieve these goals? More specifically, what sort of skills, intellects, ideas, and capabilities would be required of those that act to make these changes? And more importantly, what type of schools would be required to breed these generations of world changers? This is something that sits quite close to me. I'm fairly confident in saying that unless we revolutionize the, global sc <clears throat> the, the, the schooling system, we will never see everlasting positive global change. Even though we have some amazing technologies coming our way, we are staring down the barrel of humans' greatest dilemmas, such as overpopulation, climate change, dwindling resources, and the rise of AI. And the way that our schooling system is currently set up is grossly inequipping our kids for the real world and also the future. However, oh, it's a bit like installing a Windows Vista into a modern-day supercomputer. Now, sure, the supercomputer will do the best it can, but it's being hindered by this out-of-date and defunct operating system. In fact, come to think of it, I'm not sure if Vista ever was functional, but that's exactly what's happening to our kids right now. Our kids are little supercomputers with the potential to change the world, but without the correct operating system, i.e. the correct nurturing mindset and guidance, we are kneecapping our kids' potential. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a travesty. But there is still some hope. I know of one remarkable young 13-year-old. For his anonymity, I can never say that word, um, let's call him Dominic. Dominic is remarkable because he just gets it. He already knows what he wants. <coughs> he already, what's, what impresses me most about him is that he already knows what he wants to do in life, and he's focusing his time and attention into getting there. He already runs his own business, he can trade the foreign exchange markets, and he knows more about the world financial system than most financial advisors. Obviously, he has some remarkable mentor. But, uh, <laughs> but the funny thing is, I remember telling him once that it's futile wasting time on things that aren't congruent with your life goals. So he's done something a little bit cheeky after, after hearing that, and whenever he's issued an essay on a subject he deems not worthy or not congruent to his life goals, he simply outsources it to Indian PhDs through global arbitrage websites for a pittance, and then redirects that time he's saved on, on working on his ventures. Now, some of you may think that's just plain cheating, but that's exactly the attitude and resourcefulness that you need for the world of business, which he wants to jump into. Now, you're predominantly an audience of teachers here today, so if you do bump into Dominic, please don't lynch him. He's a really nice guy. Now, as the amazing Sir Ken Robinson uh, mentioned in one of his talks, the schooling system was designed to serve and facilitate the Industrial Revolution. So schools were set up to send as many people to the factories and employment sector as possible. And that system worked well for what it was designed to do. However, the world is now a completely alien place compared to back then. And we're going through an entrepreneurial and technological revolution. So it only seems logical that our schools must also change in order to help our kids through these global paradigm shifts. Because until that change happens, 
our schools will continue inhibiting talented young kids like Dominic. And it's kids like him that will change the world, so we need to let them flourish. I also think it's a bit of a shame that schools are indoctrinating our kids to believe that the only path to, to follow in life is the 40-40-40 plan. This is where you work 40 hours a week for 40 years and end up retiring on a pension 40% of what you struggled to live on in the first place. That's the worst financial plan one can ever do, yet it's what we all blindly sign up to. That propaganda, at the very least, needs to be addressed. So because we have all of these schools forcing or pushing people towards the 40-40-40 plan, it's no wonder that we have millions, if not billions, of people around the world that don't actually know what they want to do in life. We've, we've created, or as a result of this, generations of people that have gone to university to get a degree they didn't really care about and end up getting a job completely irrelevant to their degree. It's bonkers. And what's worse, after all of this, the majority still don't know what they want to do in life. They're leveraged to the eyeballs in student debt and haven't found their passions because that's rarely found in a job. The world doesn't need more lawyers, recruiters, politicians, bankers, or economists. The world needs more producers like doctors, teachers, and business owners. In most countries, business owners are the bedrock and backbone of a nation. They are net givers to the economy, they employ the most people, and they pay the most tax. Now, when you're looking at tech growth at the moment, it's probably fair to say that in about 10 years' time, most manual jobs right now probably won't exist especially when, with the advent of quantum computing, 3D printing, uh, and robotics. And the, 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 the world is going to change far greater over the next 40 years than what we've gone through over the last 40 years. So if we don't act, and make it an, so if we don't act now and try and overhaul our schooling system, we're doing a massive disservice for our future world. Also, I think schools need to stop being so target fixated. It's all they care about. All they care about is churning out better grades and worrying about their standing against other schools. In my opinion, they need to ditch these targets and instead focus on things that make a difference. Not learning pointless information that they will never need in the real world. To then regurgitate on paper for an exam to get grades you don't really want uh, in order to get a job you couldn't care less about. Whilst your life goals and dreams float away into the distance. It's, it, it, it's a shame, really. Um, <clears throat> so what we need is an a education revolution. And that's exactly what I intend on doing. My plan is to create a network of free schools across the country which will embrace everything I've, I've, I'm about to cover today and also everything Sir Ken Robinson has eloquently written about. So, in fact, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get him on board as the chairman of my schools. Now, <clears throat> so in a nutshell, I've created a very simple list of the top 13 things I'm going to implement in these super schools. I do love a list. So in no particular order, student learning identification. At the moment, if you can't sit still in a class, learn and convey that information onto an exam paper, you're considered dumb. That's like judging an elephant on its ability to pole vault. We all learn in different ways, visually, auditory, and kinesthetically. So our kids will be analyzed, and the syllabus will be tailored to the best learning style that suits them best. Syllabus gamif gamification. So some, one of the reasons why computer games are so darn addictive is because it brings out the competitiveness from within you, and it stimulates problem-solving areas of the, of the brain and also dopamine. When I was at school, it was very uncool to learn and do well in exams. That is simply unacceptable. So by gamifying the, the, the syllabus with social leaderboards, it will encourage kids to get to higher levels than their friends during and hopefully after schools. Ditching year groups. We all learn at different speeds, so there's no real logical reason in having year groups. So in our, in our free schools, we will have ability groups. If a kid can complete school a couple of years early, great. Experiences. One of the best ways to identify what your, your passions are, what you want to do in life, is by experiencing as many things as possible. So our kids will do every sport, activity, hobby there is, from abseiling to pottery, all by the age of 13. Nutrition. The sooner our kids learn the truth about 
fizzy drinks, sugar, and aspartame, the better. There's currently an epidemic of obesity sweeping throughout the Western world, and it's one of the biggest drains on healthcare. So, and also, healthy foods, not all of them, are bland and boring. Mentors. So this is a bit controversial, but I, I really do find it odd when I see a teacher teaching business studies from a textbook that's never actually run a successful business themselves. It's like the blind leading the blind. So schools need to reach out to local entrepreneurs to donate their time and experience. And financial education. This, this is going to be right up there, one of the most important topics in our schools, right up there, maths and the sciences. I am shocked at how many kids there are, in fact, how many adults as well, that are oblivious to mortgages, debt, interest rates, savings, investing, the markets, and life planning. With the right guidance, you can easily retire within 10 years, not this aiming to semi-retire within 40 years. And so if our, if our super school alumni can retire by the age of 30, they'll then have more time to, to focus on more philanthropical endeavors to help more people. Emotional intelligence. So one of the, the key things which our kids will learn is that you have 100% control of your thoughts, emotions, and feelings. And too many people let external stimuli affect your mood and your, and your thoughts. So <clears throat> two very good books on this is the classic How to Win Friends and Influence People and The Chimp Paradox. Robotics, 3D printing, and coding. So this will be taught to a very high level in our schools. And some of the, the, the biggest industries in the future are industries that we can't even think of yet. Uh, same as jobs and businesses, like being a 3D printing designer or a virtual reality creator. Mandarin. Now, we as a nation are dreadful at learning languages, me especially. I, I learned French for 10 years at school, yet not one person in our year group was fluent in it. So we need to change the way that we teach languages, and also Mandarin. Mandarin. Mandarin will be a very useful language in the future. The world's wealth and power is slowly moving from the West to the East, and it won't be long before they're the new superpower. Martial arts and discipline. So when you're learning martial arts, the amount of internal confidence, um, self-esteem, and discipline that you get is astounding. And also respect is simply ingrained in you. I used to be an Air Force pilot, so some of the things that I had to do and learn during officer's training will be really handy in these schools. Marriage studies, it's a sad shame that divorce rates are now 42%, and it's estimated it won't be long before it's over 50%. Marriage is no longer revered anymore. So we will have occasional marriage studies where we get a group of um, married couples who have been married for donkey's years to share their tips and experiences and teachers pay. We need to stop messing about and pay our teachers properly, starting with a minimum basic salary of £60,000 per year. Our children are our greatest assets, and so we need to do everything possible to ensure they're not being taught by overstressed teachers with, with money troubles. We need to make the profession of teaching as prestigious as being a doctor or a pilot. We need to turn our teachers into idols, not celebrities and football players. And we need to increase the minimum age of teachers so that they have valuable life experience and great learning points to pass on to our kids, not teaching straight after uni with zero life experience. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of things you need to add and remove from the schooling system. Uh, and schools are unlikely to change anytime soon. So if you're sat there thinking, you know what, some of this is actually all right. Well, I implore you to share, teach, and amaze your kids, nephews, and nieces. Thank you very much for your time. Sorry. Sorry.